Hey everyone, welcome back to Miami. Miami Beach specifically, not a bad location to have a conference. Lisa Martin here with theCUBE live at IFS Unleashed. We're going to be having a great conversation next about servitization, moments of service. Rolls Royce is here, as is the CRO of IFS for Aerospace and Defense, Scott Camerati. Nick Ward joins us as well, the VP of Digital Systems at Rolls Royce. Guys, excited to have you on the program and welcome back. Thank you very much, nice to be back. It's been three years since the last uh, IFS show. I love how, uh, Scott, I was talking with Darren Roots earlier today and I said, well, didn't it used to be IFS World? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. And I said, I love the name, I would love to, to unpack that with your chief marketing officer because it, there's a lot of, of, of power behind Unleash. A lot of companies do, such and such world or accelerate, but we're talking about unleashing the power of the technology to help customers deliver those moments of service. Yes. Love it. So, Scott, start us off here. Talk about servitization. That's a relatively new term to me. Sure. So help me understand what it means, uh, because IFS is a pioneer in this sense. We are. So one of the things that IFS is always trying to do is to try to find a way to help our customers to realize a moment of service. And that moment of service is really when they found the ability to delight their customers. And when we look at the way in which we're trying to drive those business outcomes for our customers, servitization seems to be at the core of it. So whether it's the ability for a company to use a product, a service, or an outcome, they're driving servitization in a way where they're shaping their business, they're orchestrating their customers and their people and their assets behind a value chain that helps them to provide a delightful experience for their customers. And with IFS being focused on life cycle asset management, we no longer have customers that have to choose from best of suite or best of breed. They can actually have both with IFS, and that's something we're really excited to provide to our customers, and more excited for our customers to realize that value with their customers, their partners, along the way. You mentioned customer delight, and it's a term that we, we all use it, right? But there's so much power and, and capabilities and metrics behind that phrase, customer delight, which we'll unpack. Nick, bringing you into the conversation, mm. talk to us a little bit about what your role is at Rolls-Royce. My first thought when I saw you was, oh, the fancy cars. But we're talking about <laughs> aerospace and defense, so give us a little bit of a history. Okay, so yes, we don't make cars, is the first point. So we are, <laughs> we are power. We do power as a service. So we are most well known, I guess, for large aircraft, uh, Airliners, you know, if you've, if you've flown here to Miami, there's probably a 50-50 chance you've flown on a Rolls-Royce powered aircraft. Our market segment is what we call wide-bodied aircraft, where you go on, there's two aisles, so the larger uh, section of the market. Uh, and we, we provide power, so we provide the engines, but more importantly, we've been a servitization company, a service company, for at least two decades. We, we have a, um, a service relationship we call total care. And the whole idea of total care is, yes, I have my engine, I have, it's on my aircraft, but I take care of it. I make sure it's available to fly when you need to fly it. And all of the things that have to come together to make that happen, it's a service company. Service company. Talk to me a little bit about, and I want to get, Scott, your perspective as well, but the relationship that Rolls-Royce and IFS have, this is a little bit unique. Well, I can start, but I, <laughs> I, I think Nick's going to be better served to tell us about that as our customer. Uh, Nick and I actually started this journey about four years ago. And what we did was, is we were working closely with our prospective customer, Rolls-Royce, identified what they were looking for as a desired business outcome, and then we found a way through the technology and the software that we provide to all of our enterprise customers globally to find a solution that actually helped to provide a, an outcome not only to Rolls-Royce, but also to our collective downstream customers, commercial operators around the globe. So that's where we started the journey and we're continuing our discussions around other solutions, but that's how we started and it's been an incredible partnership. We're so happy <laughs> and proud to have Nick as a customer and an advocate of all things IFS and uh, I'll let him kind of continue from his point of view how he sees the partnership and the relationship. No, thank you Scott. I think we've, we've always, we've valued the kind of relationship that we have because I think IFS has always got Rolls-Royce in terms of strategic direction. What do we try to do? I said we're a service company. You know, we, we, are, we have to have a service relationship with our, our customers, our airlines. To have a service relationship, you have to be able to connect to your service customer. 
And IFS is a big part of how we connect for data. That's how do we understand what the airline is doing with the engines, but it's also how we return data back into the airline. So we're, we've got a very close, integrated relationship between us, our airlines, through uh, a bridge that, uh, that IFS create through the maintenance product. Got so it. it works really well. I think I'd make one other point. One of the things that we've always focused on is quantifiable business value. The only way a partnership like this could possibly work is if we have a desired business outcome, but if we're providing value, so the value work that we did in conjunction with Rolls-Royce and really identifying that helped to support the business case that allowed this partnership to really begin and flourish. So I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that business value element that's really core to everything we do and all the conversations that Nick and I have. Well, it's all no, about absolutely. outcomes. It's all about outcomes. It is. It has to be about, like, it's about moments of service. Right. That's why we're here, right. So, perhaps a moment of service for Rolls-Royce is every time you're a passenger, you're going through the terminal, you expect your aircraft to be there ready, waiting for you to get on and depart on time. And our moment of service is every aircraft takes off on time every time. We live and we die by the quality of that statement, how well we live up to that statement. I think I checked this morning, there's something like 600 aircraft in the sky right now with Rolls-Royce power carrying passengers. All of those passengers have relied on that moment of service happening regularly, like clockwork, every single time. You don't get any forgiveness for a delay you get very little forgiveness for a cancellation. That has to happen. And so many things have to come together for that to happen. Those 600 aircraft, that's maybe 200,000 people right now in the sky. Wow. Those 200,000 people are trying to connect. They're trying to connect with friends. They're trying to connect with loved ones, family, colleagues, whatever the purpose is of that trip. It's really important to them. And we just have to make sure that that happens for us. We've had something like a million flights so far this year, 300 million people relying on that moment of service happening. So I really resonate with, with the language that Scott uses about the importance of, sort of that focal point on when does it all come together. Yeah. It comes together when, as a passenger, I get on the plane and it goes and I get no issues. Right, well people don't tolerate fragmented experiences anymore. No. I no. think one of the things, uh, that was in short supply during the pandemic was patience and tolerance. Sure. Not <laughs> sure how much of that's going to come back, right. but those integrated connected experiences as you described so eloquently, Nick, those are table stakes for the customers, but also the brands behind them because if customers are unhappy, the churn rates go way up and you see that reflected in obviously the success of the yeah. business. So what you guys are doing together, mm -hmm. it seems to be quite powerful. Now, then when you were on theCUBE with us, three years ago in Boston at IFS um, back then, you first introduced the Intelligent Engine right. and the Blue Data Thread. Let's talk about the Intelligent Engine. Just give our audience a refresher of what that actually entails. So perhaps if we just step one, one step back from that, just to understand how this fits in. So Rolls-Royce is a service organization, we talked about that. What that means is we take a lot of the the risk and the uncertainty away from our airline customers on the availability, the costs and maintenance effort associated with having a, having a chat engine. These are incredibly complicated and complex and sophisticated pieces of equipment. The most expensive, most sophisticated pieces of an aircraft. Managing that is, is difficult and every airline does not want to have to focus on that. They want to focus on being able to get the passengers on the aircraft, fly it, look after the airframe. So our role in that is to take that risk away, is to manage those engines, look after their health, look after their life, make sure they're available to fly whenever they need to fly. So for us to understand that, we then have to have data, we have to understand the state of every engine, where it is, the health of the engine, the life of that engine, what do we need to do next to that engine. And we can't do that unless we have data. And that data flows into a digital platform, the Intelligent Engine, which is our cloud-based AI, big data, all of the IoT, all of the big buzzwords yep. are there, right? So the data flows into that, that lets us run the models, it lets us understand, I can see something, maybe it's a, it's a small issue, but if I leave it alone, it'll become a bigger issue and maybe that will cause disruption further down the line. So we need to understand that, we need to preempt it. So 
preemptive, predictive maintenance is a, is a big part of the Huge. intelligent engine. But it's more than just that. It's also, we can understand how that engine is being flown. We can understand, is it having a really intense flight? Is it having a more benign, gentle flight? Wow. That In real changes. time? After the flight, oh, typically after the flight. But what that means is we can then understand, actually, we can keep that engine on the wing longer than you might otherwise have to do. If you have no data, you have to be conservative. Safety rules everything. Sure. So mm -hmm. data allows you to say, actually, I'm being overly conservative in this space. I can get more flying miles, flying hours from my product by extending the interval between maintenance. And the intelligent engine has a large part to play in us justifying that we are able to do that. And then the final part that it does is, eventually the engine is going to have to come off for maintenance. These things fly five million miles between overhauls. You imagine you try to do that in your family car, it's, it doesn't happen. <laughs> this incredibly sophisticated thing can fly five million miles and then we take it off for a major overhaul. But there are thousands of these engines in the fleet. We have to understand which engine is going to come off when, for what reason, and prepare our maintenance network to then receive the engine and deal with it and get it back to the customer. So the intelligent engine has a massive part to play in understanding the maintenance demand that the flying fleet is then creating. Wow, that's fascinating. And so you talked about that three years ago. What's next for that? I imagine there's only more evolution that's going to happen. It keeps growing, it keeps growing. It's driven by the data. The more data we have, the more that we can do with that. I think as well that um, you know, one of the big places that we've, we've gone is you can do as much predictive analytics as you like. There's a lot of people will talk about doing predictive analytics. But if you don't do the hard yards of turning predictive analytics into outcome, yeah. then what did you get? You, you got a bit of smart advice. So we, we take that maintenance demand, we then have to understand how that drives the orchestration and the management of all the parts, the people, the work scope definition, the allocating an engine into a maintenance slot, exactly when it's going to go and what are we going to do to it? How do we control and manage our inventory to make sure that engine is going to go through? How do we then actually execute the work inside our, our, our uh, overall shops? How do we get that engine back and, and integrate our logistics process? So the intelligent engine is, if you like, the shiny front end of a process. It's all the buzzwords, but actually the hard yards behind the scene is just as, if not more important, to get right. And again, this is why I really like the moment of service concept, because without that, the moment of service doesn't happen. The engine's not there, the part wasn't there, the field service maintenance guy wasn't there to go fix it. And brands are affected. An aircraft on the ground earns no revenue for anybody. No. It's, it's a cost, it's, it's a big sink of cost. It, it is, absolutely, and you're helping. Aircraft only earn, engines only earn when they fly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Wow, what a fascinating, the intelligent engine. Scott, talk a little bit about, we, talking about power, we can't not talk about sustainability. Yes. Uh, I understand that IFS has a new inaugural awards program that Rolls-Royce was a recipient of, the Change for Good Sustainability Awards. Congratulations. Thank one. you very much. And two, Scott, talk to me a little bit about the Change for Good program, sustainability program. What types of organizations across the industries of expertise are you looking for, and why sure. does Rolls-Royce really highlight what a winner embodies? So since Darren has joined IFS as the CEO, he's had a lot of intentional uh, areas that we focused on, and sustainability has been one that's at the top of the list. Um, IFS has a U.S. Uh, ambassador, Louis Pugh, who's our chief sustainability officer, and he helps us to provide worldwide coverage of the efforts around sustainability. So it's not just about IFS's ability to become a more sustainable organization, but it's the solutions that IFS is putting together in the five verticals that we focus on that can help those organizations achieve a level of sustainability for their, for their downstream customers, their partners, and for their enterprises themselves. So when we look at you know, the social ability for us to be more conscientious about leaving the world a better place or trying to do our best to leave the world not as bad as we came into it, 
uh, sustainability is a real focus for us and you know, the way in which we can support an organization like Rolls Royce, and Nick will obviously share those areas uh, of focus from Rolls Royce, it's a perfect fit and congratulations again for the no, award. No. Thank uh, you. We're, we're, we're so <laughs> excited to, uh, to have shared that with you. We have some other customers that have achieved it across different categories, but it's an area of current and continuous focus for IFS. Nick, talk to us, yeah. take us out here as our last question is the, the focus on sustainability at Rolls-Royce. Talk to us a little bit about that and what some of the major efforts are that you've got underway. I think, uh, you know, very similar as, as, as Scott talked, talked there, the focus within Rolls-Royce as a strategic group level is really high. Aviation particularly, I mean, we're, a, we're an engineering company, we're a power company, power inherently consumes natural resources, it tends to generate climate affecting yeah. outcomes. But at the same time, we are uh, an, an innovative organization and if anybody is going to help solve climate challenges, it's going to be organizations like Rolls-Royce who are able to bring different technologies into the market. So we have a responsibility to manage and, and optimize the behavior of our, our existing product suite, but we also have a, a a vested interest in trying to move aviation on into the next, the next phase. We talk about sustainable aviation. Aviation has to earn the right to exist. People have choices. We've come out of COVID. People are used to doing Zoom and not flying. People are used to doing things where they don't necessarily get on an aircraft and do something. The aviation business always has to earn the right from the public to exist. And increasingly, people will make choices about how they fly, when they fly, how far they fly, based on the sustainability footprint. So it's really important to us to help both our customers operate the aircraft in as sustainable and climate friendly way as we can. It's really important to find those, those balance points between the cost of an operation and its, the impact of an operation. If you go all over and say, I am going to be net, well, not even net to, but zero carbon, mm -hmm. by almost inference, that means I'm not going to operate. You have to operate to get to an outcome. But how do I do that? Well, I manage my cost, I manage the, the profitability of the organization doing it, so right. it has to be financially sustainable, it has to be sustainable for the people operating within it, it has to be sustainable for the planet, right? So, we do that in lots of different ways, in small places and in, in big places. So, Small things we do is we help the operator understand if you change your flight profile, you'll generate fewer emissions. You may avoid contrails. If you fly in a different way, maybe you create contrails. You will lose, you will lose less fuel while you're doing that, so it's cost effective for you. There is always a balance point there between the wear and tear on the engine versus the, the, the environmental impact, and you find that optimum place. One of the first things we started doing with, with Scott is we have a, a way that we life our engine components. Mm -hmm. And one of the very simple outcomes of that is using that data, the blue data, the connection to the customer. If we can see, effectively see inside the engine about how well it's wearing and we can extend those maintenance intervals as we talked about, what that eventually does is it reduces the need to take the engine off, ship it around the world, probably on a great big, Yep. 747 or maybe a year or two ago on an Antonov, four big engines flying a long distance trek, shipping our engine to an overhaul facility. We're avoiding something like 200 of those shop visit overhauls a year. Mm -hmm. So every year that's 200 flights there and back again, which don't happen. Right. Collectively that's around about 15,000 automobile equivalent emissions just don't happen. So simple things we can do just starts to have a cumulative effect. Right, S simple things that you're doing that, that have a huge impact. We could talk for so much longer on sustainability, <laughs> I'm sure we're out of time, but I can see why Rolls-Royce was, was the winner of this inaugural award. Congratulations well again. Deserved. Well deserved. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Well deserved. <laughs> so interesting to hear about the intelligent engine. So you're going to have to come back. Hopefully we'll be here next year and we can hear more of the evolution because I have a feeling there's never a dull moment in what you're doing. There's never a dull moment, there's never an end point. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gary. Uh, Scott, Nick, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. Thank it's you, been Lisa. great to have you thank and you talk much. through what's going on at IFX and the partnership with Rolls Royce. We appreciate it. And again, Nick, Nick, thank you for your continued support in the partnership. No, thank you, Scott. We appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you. Kudos all around. <laughs> all right, for my guests, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE live from Miami. We're at IFS Unleashed. We'll be back shortly after a break with our next guest, so stick around.